This video is brought to you by Captivating History. During the 19th and early 20th centuries, Thailand, formerly known as Siam, was sandwiched between British-controlled Burma and French-occupied Vietnam. So, how was it that Thailand managed to remain uncolonized by Europeans? A large part of their ability to escape the machinations of the power-hungry Europeans came down to the shrewdness of their rulers in terms of foreign relations. The Age of Discovery refers to the period between the 15th and 18th centuries, when seafaring Europeans sailed around the globe discovering new lands to conquer. This exploration led to the rise of several powerful empires that all wanted to expand their influence anywhere they could. The British, French, Spanish, Portuguese, and Dutch all led expeditions to far-off lands in the hope of taking control over the trade in that area and colonizing it with their own people and belief systems. Only a few countries managed to avoid being occupied by the Europeans. Thailand was one of them. To the west of Siam, India fell to the British and was ruled by the British Raj. To the northeast, Britain, Holland, and France were attempting to colonize China. Siam was not unknown to the Europeans, and it was only a matter of time before these European empires would start closing in. Europeans had been trading with the Siamese since around 1511, starting with the Portuguese and then the Dutch, English, Spanish, and French. Travelers and traders settled in the city of Ayutthaya and posed little threat to the kingdom. Instead, it was neighboring Burma that expanded and took the city of Ayutthaya in 1569. This conflict slowed trade with many other countries until the reign of Rama II, who, in 1818, reconnected with Portugal. Despite the Burmese's initial success in the Siamese kingdom of Ayutthaya, they never fully gained control of Siam. In 1820, the British army attacked Burma, forcing Burmese troops to return home to defend their kingdom. After 251 years of living under the threat of the Burmese, Siam was finally free of them. Two years later, Rama II reconnected with Great Britain. In 1824, Rama III came to power. Seeing that Britain could easily become a threat to Siam, he signed the Burney Treaty in 1826. This treaty allowed the English to trade in Bangkok but the conditions of the agreement were somewhat limited. Rama III also established unofficial trade relations with the United States, leading to the United States signing a treaty with Thailand in 1833. This was their first treaty with an Asian country. Rama III managed to extend trade all the way to North America and is still remembered for his outstanding foreign relations in a tumultuous time. In 1855, Rama III's half-brother, King Mongkut, also known as Rama IV, came to power. Due to his predecessor's restrictive treaties with Britain, Queen Victoria sent an emissary, Sir John Bowring, to renegotiate these treaties. Perhaps understanding that this renegotiation could be a precursor to invasion and war, Siam signed the treaty, removing tariffs placed on foreigners and giving the British diplomatic immunity. Incidentally, Bowring was so appreciative of the Siamese's warm welcome and easy negotiations that he held Rama IV in high regard, referring to him as a remarkable monarch. In 1867, Bowring was appointed as Siam's ambassador to Europe, displaying Siam's flair for foreign relations. Over the next 15 years, similar treaties were signed with other countries, including the United States. These treaties did more than prevent invaders from waging war on Siam. At first, the economy suffered. But this soon incentivized rapid growth in global trade and exports, which the king supported by renewing the kingdom's infrastructure. King Rama IV also welcomed Western influence. He employed Western tutors for his children and ensured that they understood the rapidly changing world around them. He had French missionaries teach them Latin, astronomy, and math. He also employed an English tutor called Anna Harriet Leonowens. After spending five years as a tutor to the kids of Rama IV, she wrote two memoirs about the experience. These memoirs were the basis for the 1944 book Anna and the King of Siam by Margaret Landon, which inspired four films, a stage musical, and a TV series. These books and theatrical versions are highly controversial in Thailand and have been banned due to historical inaccuracies. When Rama IV died, his successor and son was only 16 and not yet ready to lead the kingdom. Instead, he spent five years traveling through countries colonized by the Europeans, learning about their political and judicial procedures. 
Where Rama IV dipped his toes into the sea of Western practices, Rama V waded right in. He spent a great deal of time on foreign relations and reformed Siam's system of government. Previously, Siam was run as a mandala political system. Simply put, this meant that the kingdom was divided amongst rulers of varying power and status. These leaders paid tribute to any potentates that were more powerful than them, with the Siamese king being the pinnacle of the power pyramid. Rama V deposed local rulers, centralizing the power in Bangkok. This consolidation of power ultimately united and strengthened Siam. He reinforced this by pushing for formal education and enforcing military conscription, which encouraged the feeling of citizenship. Rama V also abolished slavery and state labor, while introducing a police force, government-run tax collection, and infrastructure such as railways. In addition, he fostered the idea of unity by introducing Thai as the nation's only official language. Rama V used compromise to his advantage, and he conceded many Siamese lands to keep sovereignty and avoid ultimate colonization by the West. In 1886, Rama V feared that the French would annex Luang Prabang after they acquired Cambodia and sent expeditions along the Mekong River. He signed a treaty with France that asserted Laos as a tributary state to Siam. However, in 1889, a bill was signed designated Luang Prabang as being under the protection of France. This agreement was due to the French helping to defend the city against the Chinese. In 1893, the French sent warships to Bangkok, now referred to as the Pak Nam Incident. Both sides instigated the incident, as the French had sent troops into Laos and ousted a Siamese commissioner. This commissioner then ambushed the French and killed a French officer. France used this killing to justify sending in warships and pressure Siam to give up its territories in Laos. Two ships were sent to Pak Nam at the mouth of the Chao Freya River. At first, the Siamese were unsure of how to proceed. Believing they would be supported by the British and under the advice of a Belgian justice minister, they decided to attack the ships. The result was a 25-minute gun battle ultimately won by France, and the warships continued up the river. Upon reaching Bangkok, they aimed their guns at the royal palace and gave the Siamese an ultimatum. First, they would withdraw Siamese troops from Laos, and second, they would pay the French a large sum of money. The Siamese had two days to answer and agreed to these terms before an all-out war. The French likely thought the Siamese would be unwilling to withdraw their troops and unable to pay the indemnity so France could wage war on Siam and claim all of their territories. They had not bargained on the reasonability of Rama V or the wealth they had been amassing since Rama III. The government and nobles all contributed gold in order to remain independent, and Rama V agreed to the terms set by France. On October 3, 1893, all Siamese-occupied territories in Laos were ceded to France. This incident was not the only compromise by Rama V that allowed him to keep the sovereignty of Siam and in 1907, they also handed over land in Cambodia. In 1909, they gave up many Malayan regions to Britain. In these compromises, Thailand kept its ultimate independence and established itself as a global force. In stark contrast to its colonized neighbors, in 1902, the country unofficially dubbed itself Pratet Thai, meaning country of the free. Siam officially changed its name to Thailand in 1939. Thailand being free also benefited the British and the French, as it acted as a buffer zone between their territories. The French and the English have a long history of territory grabbing, with parts of France being historically ruled by the English and vice versa. This neutral zone between the countries they controlled saved many disputes and perhaps even bloodshed, and both countries weren't particularly eager to butt heads. By adopting Western political methods and unifying the kingdom under one ruler, Thailand legitimized itself in the eyes of the Western countries. When World War I broke out, Thailand joined the Allied nations. This was the first time Thai soldiers were sent to another country to fight. Unlike its neighboring colonized countries, Thailand entered the war as an independent country. When the war was over, Thailand was invited to be a founding member of the League of Nations. Somewhat ironically, it was the modern policies of the kings of Siam that led to their loss of power. As Thai students studied abroad, they realized that Thailand would never be truly modernized with an absolute monarchy. In 1932, a coup was staged, and with typical Siamese diplomacy, the king ceded to the demands of the newly formed People's Party. 
After this bloodless coup, which lasted only a few short hours, Thailand became a constitutional monarchy, ruled by a government but still supporting a royal family with no direct power. Six years after the coup, World War II broke out. Unlike during the First World War, Thailand declared neutrality, much to the dismay of the Allied forces. Thailand then formed a friendship with Japan instead, using this alliance to take back territories from the French. Unfortunately, it led to Thailand being ruled by a Japanese-backed puppet government, and many of the hard-won alliances that Thailand had achieved were undone. Many living in Thailand did not agree with this new fascist stance, and rebellions were organized by the same man who was instrumental in overthrowing the Thai monarchy, Preeti Phnom Yong. Since its official founding in 1238, Thailand has fought off its fair share of invaders. Going from a nation of separate kingdoms to one united country undoubtedly helped to keep its independence in the face of European colonization. While there are many contributing factors, the Thai people ultimately have their forward-thinking monarchy to thank for this. By unifying the kingdoms, understanding the Western political system and philosophies, as well as being willing to compromise, Thailand was able to escape the clutches of the European empires a feat that only a handful of countries in the world achieved. Having excelled in diplomacy rather than warfare, Thailand asserted itself as a formidable country. Its beautiful beaches, ancient temples, and bustling capital make today's Thailand a popular tourist destination. The people have maintained the friendly and respectful attitudes that helped them historically maintain good foreign relations when invasion and colonization were the norms. All of this makes Thailand the truly unique country it is today. To learn more about Thailand, check out our book, History of Thailand, A Captivating Guide to the Thai People and Their History. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free mythology bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.